So far, we've looked at simple ways of representing functional relationships with mathematical models. But usually in science, we don't have perfect knowledge of the functional relationships between variables. So what we'll do is use statistical relationships or statistical models. Now statistical models will add in one additional component to our model that we've seen so far. Because so far, we've actually been able to perfectly represent individual scores on the basis of explanatory variables. But for statistical models, we'll add in an additional component, individual error. Now this individual error will reflect the sum of or the total of all the other things we didn't measure. That is, we won't be able to perfectly represent an individual score simply on the basis of that overall constant and the effect of a measured variable. That is, people will differ from that sum of the overall constant and the effect of the measured variable. And this again reflects all the things we didn't actually measure. Let's look at a situation in which we'll have this individual error, and hopefully that will make clear what we mean by all the things we didn't measure. Let's look at a particularly unpredictable situation, predicting flight costs. Imagine again we collect 100 randomly selected individuals and ask them how much they paid for a recent flight. So here we have the histogram of these measurements, and again we have something to explain. People are differing in how much they spent. Some people spent as low as 240, and some people as high as 360. Now we can think of a couple different variables that might explain a little bit of these differences among people. We probably can think of many variables, but let's pick one to start. How about the duration of the flight? So suppose we actually ask them to report the duration of the flight, and we end up with this scatter plot. Now you can probably already see there's a pretty coherent relationship here. Now these are fabricated data, but I think this is probably going to reflect the truth in the world, which is that flights that are longer typically cost more. They're usually longer flights because they're going to more distant places. So we're able to relate in some way the cost of flight to flight duration. But notice that this relationship isn't perfect. Now let's put this into our mathematical model and see what we mean. In this case, price of flight in that particular scatter plot is 258 some baseline, and we'll talk about what that means, plus 30 cents for each minute of the flight, and plus individual air. So let's look at all these components in the plot. First, notice that the price for the flight, that is how much individuals are spending overall, is related to flight duration. But for every additional minute of flight, we're adding just a little bit more to that line. But that line doesn't perfectly represent every person. Take the people at 150 minutes. There's spread around that line. That is, there's individual air. One of these people, let's just take this person up here, is at 150, and this line would make a prediction for how much their flight should cost, but they're deviating from that average trajectory. That is, the person has individual air. There are other things about that individual's flight that are probably accounting for it to be a higher cost. It may have simply been the time of day this person purchased the flight, or the day of the week, or the fact that that flight was to a more popular destination. There are other factors other than flight duration that explain cost of flight, and we only have one variable in this data set that is actually used for explanation. So we have a model, and it's not perfectly explaining cost of flight, but it does help us understand a little bit about what factors influence the cost of flight. Now let's take a second to look at the 258, our baseline here. Now that baseline in this type of model represents the y-intercept, something we'll come back to when we talk about these models more thoroughly. But for now, notice that what that represents is simply what the price of a flight would be predicted to be if it had zero minutes of duration. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense for a functional relationship, but for a statistical relationship like this, that's a useful component of our model. It's the baseline before we add in the additional cost for each minute. Now, instead of using a quantitative predictor like flight duration, let's try to explain these differences among people, that is the differences in how much they spent, in terms of a grouping variable, like we did for parking permit costs. In this case, it would make sense to represent it in terms of the airline or something else that groups these individuals. Here, we have the Delta group, the Southwest group, and the Virgin group. In this case, we can see that there are differences between these airlines in terms of the average cost. I have in blue here the overall average, and let me add in the averages for each of these groups. So we can see that Delta is a little bit above average, Southwest Airlines a little bit below that average, and Virgin America a little bit below that average. 
Let's imagine when I collected these data, and I'm not so crazy to actually do this in an airport, but if I did, let's imagine this was an airport terminal that only had these three airlines. So these are the only groups we actually observed in these data. Now let's see how we can describe this in terms of a mathematical model. Again, we'll have our basic mathematical model template, an individual score on that outcome measure, how much they paid, equal to again some overall constant, plus the effect of some measured variable, plus individual error. In this case, it's going to be the price for flight is equal to that overall average price plus the cost offsets for each of the different airlines. Again, remember, we're going to be using these models to make inferences about populations. This is really just a sample of individuals. So representing this model as a cost offset model, or what's known again as an effects coded model, will be useful for us. But again, remember, the combined sum of that red and blue section is really just the mean for each of those groups. So in actually calculating these, it's as simple as just finding the mean for each group and the difference to the overall average. But let's look at these offsets on our actual plot. Again, for delta, we can see delta is $11 over the average, Southwest, $3.40 less than the average, and Virgin, a little over $8.33 less than the average. We've again just described the differences between the groups and the overall grand mean. But notice again that within each group, there is still individual error. That individual error is capturing all the other things we didn't measure. And for this model, we're not using minutes of duration, and we already saw that that did relate to cost of flight. So this individual error in each of these different groups is still there. Our mathematical models are describing a statistical relationship. It's showing what the average is for these different groups, which may for us be a very useful thing. Because going forward, maybe we want to know if Delta, Southwest, and Virgin actually differ in their overall costs. That is, overall, if we were to observe everybody, would these airlines actually differ? We're going to be able to make an inference about that using those cost offsets. But we always have to keep in mind that there's still individual error. Our statistical models aren't reflecting every person's exact value, but instead the average within these different groups. So we've seen two different types of models we can use to describe observations we make. Functional models or functional relationships where we actually know all the different things that are contributing to the outcome measure. In those models, there isn't individual error. You might recall when we looked at the cost of laundry or the cost of going to that nightclub, there was no differences among people at the different levels of whatever our explanatory variable was. We were able to model the exact functional relationship. Statistical relationships, on the other hand, don't have all the different predictors that are actually mattering in the model themselves. And that's what feeds into that individual error. People differ at the different levels of our explanatory variable. Just knowing how many minutes somebody flew on an airline doesn't tell you exactly what their actual cost should be. People who fly at 150 minutes will pay different amounts in terms of their ticket price. Similarly, people who are on Delta Airlines are not going to pay the exact same price for their airline ticket. There are other things that are contributing to their actual cost. So individual error in statistical models is a really important concept. It's all the variability that continues to exist after we've explained something on the basis of our explanatory variable. And it's that individual error that's going to give us a benchmark to understand how big the effects we actually measure are. Knowing how much individuals still vary within their groups tells us something about whether those group differences, those treatment offsets, are actually reliable, whether they actually exist in the population even though we've measured them in our sample. Remember, we're always going to have to deal with sampling error, and so that individual error in our mathematical models is going to be a reflection of sampling error. And we'll be able to know, on the basis of that individual error, whether the offsets we measured for our explanatory variables actually reflect something true in the population or are simply the consequence of sampling error.